You might wonder why I am wearing a yarmulke, also known as a kippah. Uh, if you were to go to a Jewish home for Passover, an Orthodox Jewish home, you would find the men wearing a kippah, a yarmulke. And uh, there's nothing biblical about it. In fact, it was in, I think, the 1800s that a rabbi uh, uh, said that, you know, uh, when men wear a covering on their head, it is a sign of reverence and respect and submission to Almighty God. And this caught on in the Jewish community. And if you know anything about uh, the Jewish community, it's all about tradition. Tradition, tradition. It became a tradition. And so now if you go to a synagogue that's uh, conservative or orthodox, you will find the men donning uh, a yarmulke or a, a kippah. And often out in public, the orthodox will wear that to show their submission to God, their, their respect and reverence for him. Well, let's pray together this morning, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this special time that we can come and we can gather and we can learn about you and your Son and what he did for us on the cross of Calvary through the Passover feast. Uh, Lord, help us to see Yeshua, the Messiah today. Help us to see him and his passion and his glory. May the message be clear. And may we be drawn to your Son in a saving way. In Jesus' name, amen. Passover, of all the feasts, Passover is uh, the most special. It is a very special and significant day on the Jewish calendar. In fact, Passover has the distinction of being the uh, oldest continuously celebrated religious holiday or feast known to mankind. This celebration commemorates the day when the Jewish people were freed from bondage and slavery in Egypt by the power of God. Many centuries later, in Jerusalem, Jesus the Messiah gave his life as the Lamb of God. As he did so, he took upon himself, in his own body, all of our sin all of our shame and all of our guilt and the punishment that we deserved, he, he took it in our place. Jesus died in the right place. He died in Jerusalem. He died at the right time. He died at Passover as the Passover lamb. He died in the right way. He shed his blood and he rose from the dead to free us from the bondage, guilt, and shame of sin and also from the dread of death and judgment. The Apostle Paul wrote something very significant. Remember, Paul is writing to the Corinthians, but he's writing as a Jewish man. And he says this, For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. As Paul looked back to the original Passover and the Passover lambs, he thought of Jesus. Remember Jan, John the Baptist? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is our Passover Lamb, sacrifice for you and for me. Today, we have gathered at the home of Rabbi Andy Goldberg. And before Passover, before the Passover feast, the meal, the observance, spring, tra spring training, I live in Arizona where you have spring, spring cleaning, not training, spring cleaning. And prior to Passover, many Jewish families uh, engage in a, a very rigorous spring cleaning. This has biblical precedent. If you open your Bibles this morning to the book of Exodus, the 12th chapter, Exodus chapter 12, which is the Passover chapter of the Bible. Exodus 12, I want to pick it up in verse 15. The 12th chapter, the 15th verse. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Now remember, leaven is a symbol of what? Who can tell me? Sin or evil. So seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. No yeast, no leaven in the bread. Even the first day you shall put away leaven out of your houses, 
For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul, it's a very serious thing, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. Dropping down to verse 18. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month at even, you shall eat unleavened bread until the one and twentieth day of the month at even. Seven days shall be no leaven found in your houses, for whosoever eateth that which is leavened, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. Ye shall eat nothing leavened in all your habitations, uh, shall ye eat unleavened bread. And so in the Jewish home, particularly the Orthodox Jewish home, they will scour their home from, from top to bottom, and they will get rid of, rid of any product, any food containing yeast or leaven. Again, because it is a sin, symbol of, of sin or evil uh, throughout the Bible. They pack up or give away their unopened leavened foods, and they'll fill their kitchen cupboards with special Passover food. I was uh, teaching a class uh, in the Phoenix area uh, a few years ago about uh, reaching out to your Jewish friend and neighbor, and a number of people in that class said, well, we don't know any Jewish people. And you know, before our class was done, it was a seven-week class, and before it was done, every single member of that class, during the time of the class, met a Jewish person. It was like God was saying, okay, you're receiving this instruction about how to reach out to your Jewish neighbor and friend, and zap, here comes a Jewish person into their life. One lady went to the grocery store, saw her neighbor, looked in her cart, and it was filled with Passover foods. And she said, are you Jewish? Yes. Her next door neighbor was Jewish. She never knew it, but now she knows. She was getting ready for Passover. Now, some of the traditional or Orthodox Jews actually will sell their leavened products to their Gentile neighbors during the week of Passover. And then at the end, they, they buy them back. At the Passover meal, there's a lighting of the candles that takes place. And in the traditional Jewish home, it is the wife not the husband or father, but it's the, the wife and mother of the home. She is the one who lights the candle, who begins the, the meal, the feast, and she offers a prayer, and as she prays, she does this as if uh, raising her prayers to heaven. Now, we're going to look at a picture today of the Passover. And in a few moments, as we look at what I call the mechanics of the Passover Seder, uh, I don't want you to get lost in the mechanics. I want you to see the Messiah. I want you to hear his message, both of which are clearly portrayed in this meal. Now, according to Exodus chapter 12, they were to select a perfect, unblemished lamb for the Passover feast. If you'll turn back in Exodus 12 in your Bibles, Exodus chapter 12, I want to read uh, verse 5, the, the fifth verse of Exodus chapter 12. Your lamb shall be without blemish. It could have no defects, no blemishes. It had to be a perfect lamb. A male of the first year, you shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And so they were to take this perfect unblemished lamb, they were to examine it to make sure there were no defects. What a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. He, during his life and ministry, uh, he was put under extreme scrutiny. Even his enemies had to admit they could find no defect, no fault in him. They had to invent stories. They had to try to, to uh, they actually perjured themselves. They, 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 they tried to uh, frame him, but there was no guilt. There was nothing they could find, no fault in him. So they were to select this perfect lamb, which again pictures the Lord Jesus, and then they were to sacrifice the lamb. Look at verse 6. And you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And so they had to select the lamb. 
Again, they had to be a perfect lamb. Then they were to sacrifice the lamb. They, they were to slay the lamb. And then they were to take the blood from that lamb and stain the doorpost and the lintel. Uh, look, at, uh, look at verses 8 through 11. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire, and on leavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire. By the way, this is a symbol of judgment. This, this is to be burned in the fire. It is to, to be judged. And uh, they're to let nothing that remain until morning. That which remaineth of it until morning ye shall burn with the fire. And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand. And ye shall eat it in haste, for it is the Lord's Passover. So we see the instructions that are given. Now as they were to take the blood of the lamb and to stain the doorpost and the lintel of the home, lintel being up here, doorpost being here. Do you see the symbol, the picture of a cross? Now in the original Passover, it, it is grown. It has changed over the years, but in the original Passover, it was if, uh, when it was instituted by Almighty God, there were only three items. There have been some items added over the year that have become part of the tradition. Tradition. But in the original Passover meal, there were three items. First of all, there was lamb. Now today, when you attend, if you are privileged enough to be asked by a Jewish friend or neighbor, to attend a Passover Seder meal at their home, you won't be eating lamb. There's a reason for that. But originally, it was lamb. And this little bone from a lamb has traveled with me all across the country. An unblemished lamb was to be sacrificed. And it's of interest to me that as the instructions are given concerning this lamb, they were to be very careful that they did not break any of the bones of the Passover lamb. Look at verse 46 of Exodus 12. Verse 46. In one house shall it be eaten. Thou shalt not carry forth aught of the flesh abroad out of the house, neither shall ye break a bone thereof. So as they eat from the lamb, they're not to break a bone. Why is this? Well, we know that one of the Psalms tells us that when Messiah suffers and dies for the sins of his people, that not one of his bones would be broken. It was traditional when uh, criminals hung upon a cross when they were being crucified that the soldiers would come and break a leg and break both legs in fact so that uh, it would bring their death on much quicker but when they got to Jesus they found out what he he'd already died he'd already he'd already given up his spirit so they didn't have to break a bone even in that we see the hand of God a lamb that was sacrificed. I believe this picture is a Messiah who was sacrificed for our sins. He was slain for our sin. The prophet Isaiah uh, speaks of him, writes of him in Isaiah chapter 53, if you'll turn there. Today, Isaiah chapter 53 is the forbidden chapter. It is no longer read in the synagogues. Uh, earlier, Bef I mean, back before the time of Jesus and the crucifixion, uh, Jewish writers would write of Isaiah 53 as speaking of the Messiah. But Jewish interpreters no longer believe that. This chapter is somewhat of a, a difficult portion for them. They really don't know what to do with it. Isaiah 53, I want to begin with verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he... Now let me stop for a moment. Do you notice the repetition of the word he, he, he is talking about a person. If you say to a Jewish friend, go to your rabbi and ask him who Isaiah 53 is talking about, the rabbi will probably say, well, it's not talking about a person, it's talking about the nation of Israel and her sufferings. But notice the personal pronoun. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. 
yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off. That, that's a, a word, cut off, meaning death. He was slain out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Now, since the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70, something horrible happened in Israel in A.D. 70. A Roman general by the name of Titus came into Jerusalem and he destroyed the city. And remember when Jesus said not one stone will be left on top of another? All of the temple was destroyed. All you have there today is a retaining wall, but none of the structure remains. There are still some great stones lying on the ground from the temple, but not one is on another. So, uh, in AD 70, the temple is destroyed. Therefore, there are no more sacrifices. We've got a big problem. What can take away my sin? See, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. There's no longer any priesthood. And so, today, instead of eating lamb, when you go to a typical home, a Jewish home for a Passover Seder meal, you'll probably be served chicken, maybe a beef brisket, but you won't be eating lamb. A second thing on the plate, and you probably can't see it, but uh, there's a bitter herb, a bitter herb, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But why, is the, why, why was there a bitter herb on the original Passover uh, Seder plate? Why was it a part of the original meal? Well, I think the bitter herb pictures a suffering Messiah, a suffering Messiah. He was slain, he suffered, he suffered greatly. Notice verses 3 through 6 of Isaiah 53. He, whoever this person is, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Even today, he is despised and he is not esteemed. Verse 4, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet did we esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Did you notice that he was a man acquainted with grief and sorrows? Did you notice that he was a man who was despised and rejected? A man of sorrow, stricken, smitten by God? I mean, bitter. Bitter herbs. Then there was a third thing on the table. In fact, uh, I have it in here. Unleavened bread. This is called matzah bread. It's more like a cracker, but unleavened bread. And this speaks of a sinless Messiah, a sinless Savior. Again, uh, there was no deceit found upon his mouth. He had done nothing wrong. As you look at this carefully, you'll notice a couple of things. First of all, there are stripes. With his stripes we are healed. Speaking of our spiritual healing. And then you'll notice one other thing. Little holes, little piercings. Zechariah says, the day is coming in which the Messiah is going to return in glory. And when he returns, Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10 says, they will see the one they have pierced. And they will mourn over him and grieve for him as, as if for an only son. He was pierced, wounded for our iniquity. And so the unleavened bread speaks of a sinless Messiah. 
Now, for you and I who are believers in and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, this picture of him as Messiah is so clear, it is, it is so evident, and yet so many of our Jewish friends just cannot see the connection. They, they cannot see the picture, perhaps they will not see the picture. I actually had a rabbi tell me one day, he said, you know, intellectually, I understand what you're saying, but emotionally, I cannot go there. I just cannot go there as a Jew and believe in Jesus. Uh, and yet, the last of the Jewish prophets saw it so clearly. His name was John. And one day, he saw Jesus coming and he said, Behold, look, that man, he's the Lamb of God. And he's come to take away the sin of the world. Passover Seder. The word Seder means order. And this meal is orderly. It's done in sequence. And we're going to go through now the mechanics of the Passover Seder. The order of it. But again, don't get lost in the mechanics and miss the Messiah or his message. First of all, there is a cup of wine or juice, depending upon the home. Four times, in fact, during the Passover Seder, the cups are filled with wine or grape juice, and a Hebrew blessing is pronounced over the cup. The first cup is called the Kaddush, which means holiness. It is the cup of holiness. Holiness is where we must begin in our journey with God. God is holy. Today's church has forgotten, in large measure, the holiness of God. You know, the Puritans, they stress the holiness of God. Remember Jonathan Edwards' great, great sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God? God was holy and God was angry and they stressed the holiness of God, but they didn't know a lot about the love of God. And then Dwight L. Moody came along, that great, that great evangelist, the, the Billy Graham of his day, and he began to preach more on the love of God, and uh, people needed that. And yet, today we've gone way the other extreme. We've forgotten the holiness of God. Today all you hear about is the love of God. And yet both are taught in the Bible and must be taught in, in balance. Uh, the prophet Habakkuk said this of God, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look upon iniquity. It was after seeing God's absolute holiness that Isaiah was able to see his own absolute sinfulness. In fact, you remember that Isaiah said, you know, I, I'm an unclean man. I, I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of an unclean people. It was only after he saw that vision of, of God seated on his throne and, and the uh, heavenly creatures crying out what? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And when Isaiah saw that, he realized how undone he was, how wicked he was, how sinful. And so they begin with the first cup, the holiness of God. Following that, they dip their hands in a bowl. It's a ceremonial washing. It is a tradition that's been added by the rabbis over the years. External washings, very important in Judaism. Ritual washings. And yet Jesus said to the Pharisees, you clean the outside of the platter, You clean the outside, but the inside is still full of filth and corruption and evil. You're whitewashed sepulchers. You're, you're dead on the inside. And so it is so important that we remember that God is much more interested in clean hearts than he is in clean hands. Then they take the, some parsley and they dip it in salt water. And when they eat of it, if the salt water is strong enough, 
it will bring tears to the person's eyes. They dip the parsley into salt water. They say another blessing in Hebrew, then they eat of the parsley. Why parsley? This leafy herb is on the table to remind us of the hyssop that was used by the Israelites to apply the blood of the Passover lamb to the doorpost and the lintel of the door. Why the salt water? The salt water, again, brings tears to one's eyes, and this reminds the Jewish home, the Jewish children, of the, the bitterness of bondage and slavery that their ancestors went through during their 400 and some years of slavery and bondage in Egypt. It was a, a, a cruel time. In fact, you might remember from reading the book of Exodus that it was when God saw their tears that he was moved to raise up a deliverer, a savior. And his name was? Who can tell me? Moses. God raised up a Moses to deliver them from Egyptian bondage. Then, at this stage of the Seder, they reach in here. There are three pieces of matzah bread, all unleavened. They take the middle piece, not the top piece, not the bottom piece, but the middle piece, and they break it. They break it. Why are there three pieces of matzah bread? Why not one? Why not four? Why three? And why is it that the middle one is broken, not the first one and not the third? I think here we have a picture of the Trinity. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the middle one is the one that is broken because was it not our Lord Jesus Christ whose body was broken, not his bones, but his body was broken for us. And then they take this middle matzah and they wrap it and they hide it somewhere. And then later on, they will hunt for it, bring it back to the table and share it with everyone at the table. Again, I think this is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. His body was broken, it was wrapped, it was placed in a grave, it was resurrected, and now it is shared with everyone. This, when they wrap this and hide it, is called the Athi Coleman. Can you say that with me? Athi Coleman. It's not a Hebrew word. Every other word is Hebrew. This is a Greek word that has found its way into the Passover Seder. Most Jewish people don't know what it means. You know what it means? He's come. He's come. Not he's coming. He's come. Who's the he? Messiah. Jesus. He's come. At this point, there is a book that they will read, and it tells the story of the Passover. Sometimes a Jewish Passover meal can last four hours. Uh, so I'm not going to read from that long, long book. But uh, the Passover story is told. They tell about the slavery in Egypt. They tell about the plagues that uh, took place and especially the final plague, the, the death of the firstborn. They talk about the Passover lamb. They, they tell uh, the family, the children from generation to generation about the crossing of the Red Sea experience. And during all of this, the children are encouraged to ask four different questions. Why is this night of Pesach so different from all other nights of the year? On all other nights, we may eat either leavened or unleavened bread. Why on this night can we only eat unleavened bread? On all other nights, we may eat any species of herb, but on this night, we can only eat bitter herbs. Why is this? And on all other nights, we do not dip, even drink, either sitting or reclining. Why on this night do we all recline? The discussion that follows in the home provides a wonderful way for the Jewish family to summarize the Passover story. And then comes the second cup of wine. 
or juice. This is called the cup of judgment. Why? Well, the first cup, anybody remember what the first cup was called? The cup of holiness. Second cup is the cup of judgment. Because God is holy, he must judge sin. You see, if God wasn't holy, he could look the other way. You know, when my children sin, I sometimes would punish them, but sometimes I'd look the other way. Because I'm not holy. You know, we can wink at other people's sin. Or our own. But God can't do that because he's holy. He must judge sin. The wages of sin is death. So, the second cup. The cup of judgment. At this point, there's another ceremonial washing, and then another Hebrew blessing. And then they eat the matzah. They eat a piece of matzah bread, and uh, again, it's unleavened. And this points for the need of self-examination. When you have a communion service, and, and it's my belief that you really don't fully understand the Lord's table to you understand the Passover Seder. The Lord's table was born out of the Passover Seder. And before we partake of the cup or the bread, Paul tells us to first examine ourselves and then we're to eat. Remember that spring cleaning ritual? That's really what we're to go through at the Lord's table. We're to, we're to examine ourselves for any, any yeast or leaven in our heart, any evil, any sin. We're to confess it. We're to be cleansed and then eat. And so, again, a reminder for self-examination and self-judgment. And then on the table, and again, I don't know how well you'll be able to see this, but someone has been kind enough to make this for me, is called haroset. Haroset. And it's a mixture of apples and cinnamon and walnuts and maybe some dates. And uh, it's kind of sweet. How did that get on the table? Well, rabbis tell us that this is a symbol of the mortar that was placed between the bricks as the slaves in Egypt had to build these, these huge uh, buildings in Egypt and it reminds them, it's a reminder to them of, of what life was like when they were slaves in Egypt and what God delivered them from. Also on the table, it's something that's been added by the rabbis over the years, there's an egg. There's an egg, a roasted egg. And rabbis tell us that that egg is there to remind them of the sorrow of the destruction of the temple. And it's become a tradition, not part of the original Passover Seder, but it's become a tradition. But I think in the providence of God that just as this is pierced and has stripes, that the egg may have another meaning. Because the egg is a symbol of what? After Good Friday comes Resurrection Sunday, and the egg is a symbol of resurrection life, new life. And that is a part of the Passover Seder because we know that Messiah that Isaiah tells us and the psalmist tells us that after his death he would see the light of life he would be resurrected from the dead and this point uh, they make a little sandwich it's called a Hallel sandwich I'm just gonna make a real small one We'll put, there we go. Now at this point, I like to do an interactive Seder. I need a volunteer. I need a volunteer. Somebody else ready? Somebody, I need a volunteer. Somebody, don't make me draft you. Thank you. Come on up here. Come on up here. You are very brave. Your name is? Isabel. Isabel? Yes, sir. This is Hallel sandwich. If, you, if we were in a Jewish home together, this would be part of the Passover Seder meal. We have unleavened bread and some horseradish. Do you like horseradish? Never had it. This is going to be fun. <laughs> Pardon? Never had it. 
partake. Interesting. <laughs> now, Isabel, I want to know what, in one word, describe the sensation you're getting. Strong. Keep going. Strong. Spicy. Spicy. Keep going. Overwhelming. Overwhelming? <laughs> Does the word bitter come up? Yes. Bitter. That's the word I'm looking for. It is a bitter, and there's a reason it's bitter. I'll explain that in a minute, but since you were the first volunteer, I have one of three. This was not part of the original Passover Seder, by the way. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Give her a big hand. You did a great job. Thank you. Spicy, strong, bitter. The sandwich is bitter to remind them again of the bitterness and bondage of slavery. Can you imagine being a people, being enslaved to cruel taskmasters for 400 years? We saw... It's a semblance of that in America during the years of slavery. It's bitter. You know, there are people who are bitter to this day because of what took place back then. And to remind them of how bitter it was. But I think there's an application for us as well. Did you know that sin, sin always appears to be sweet. The writer of Hebrews talks about the, the pleasures of sin for a season. You know, if sin wasn't pleasurable, I, I don't think we'd be attracted to it. We wouldn't be tempted by it. The pleasures of sin for a season. But after a season, what happens? The effects, the results of sin enter our lives. And then it becomes what? Bitter. I was a pastor for 32 years, and I know Pastor Andy could identify with this as well. I cannot tell you how many times people would come to my office, perhaps months or even years after a particular transgression, and they would stand before me in bitterness, weeping, broken, because they were now inheriting the wind. They sowed to the wind, they're now inheriting the wind. And you know, I'd have to tell those folks, I've got good news and I've got bad news. Good news is forgiveness is available, but I can't undo the consequences. I can't undo the consequences. So it's a reminder of the bitterness of bondage and slavery and sin becomes a cruel taskmaker, a cruel taskmaster, I should say. Well, at this point, if we were in a Jewish home, uh, we would break and we would eat a great meal. Uh, in fact, uh, I was just at a meal. It wasn't, wasn't a Jewish home, but a, a Christian home. We did a Passover Seder and we had chicken and mashed potatoes and salad and dessert. And uh, it was wonderful. And they have a, a, a wonderful feast. And then they come back after the meal. They come back and this is where it kind of gets fun. The children, remember the afikoman I mentioned, they break it, and they wrap it, and they hide it, and they search for it, and they bring it back and share it with everyone? Well, somewhere in this wonderful sanctuary, the afikoman has been hidden. And if you are in high school on down, when I count to three and say go, the search is on, and the individual who finds the Athi Coleman is going to get a reward. One, are you ready out there? One, two, three, go. Come on over here. Come on over here. Your name is? Neil. Neil? Let me check. Let me check here. 
Lots of bread, and it's broken. How old are you, Neil? Fourteen. Fourteen? Boy, you got that in a hurry. Did good. I don't, you probably don't like chocolate. I, I, ladies like chocolate, but I, guys don't like chocolate. Do I do. You do? <laughs> well, would you like a Mr. Goodbye or Hershey bar? Mr. Goodbye. I, I think good choice, good choice. Thank you. Give him a big hand. In the Jewish home, they sometimes will give them money, gifts, or candy. Then we come to the third cup. The third cup. And this is called the cup of redemption. Now remember, first cup is the cup of holiness. God is holy. Second cup, the cup of judgment. Because God is holy, he must judge sin. Third cup, cup of redemption. The only way to avoid the judgment of God for our sin is to experience what? Redemption. The cup of redemption. What was true in Egypt is true today. Judgment was coming upon the firstborn in all the Egyptian households. The only, one to, the only way excuse me, to avoid it was to select a perfect lamb, slay that lamb, apply the blood, to the doorpost and the lintel of the home. And then when the angel of judgment came, and he saw the blood, what did he do? He passed over, he passed over, passed by that home. There was no judgment because the blood had been applied. Redemption had taken place. So the third cup is the cup of redemption. At this time, there is a search that has to go on because there's an empty chair at the table. When you go to a Jewish home for a Passover Seder meal, you'll always find one empty place setting, one empty chair. And that is for the prophet Elijah. In the book of Malachi, we are told that Elijah would come again before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So, the Jewish people continue to look for Elijah to come. By the way, I think he's going to come. I think he's probably one of the two witnesses in the book of Revelation. I think Malachi is going to be literally fulfilled. Now, Jesus said that John the Baptist was a picture, a type, a partial fulfillment, I believe, of Elijah, but Elijah is yet going to come. And so every year at Passover time, they set a place for Elijah. I keep expecting him. I need a volunteer. Young lady on the left, your hand went up first, I believe. I need you to go, go to that door over there and, and go see if Elijah's outside. He might be out there trying to get in. you see him? You better call for him. He's kind of hard of hearing. <laughs> Is he there? He stood us up again. Come on back. Come on back. Come on up here. And your name is? I'm sorry? Kaden. Say it nice and loud. Caden. Caden. I love that name, Caden. And how old are you? Nine. Nine. Ten. Sorry. Ten, okay. Just turned ten? Mm -hmm. So ten years old, and uh, you're sure Elijah wasn't there? Mm -hmm. Okay. You like chocolate? Mm -hmm. Like a lot? Yes. You want this? Yes. Thank you. Did a good job. Big hand. As they come to the close of the Passover Seder, they sing. We're not going to sing. I'm not going to sing. Be thankful. Last time I sang, it moved the audience to tears. Uh, but they, 
They sing from the Psalms. That's the Jewish songbook, the Hebrew songbook. And it's of interest to me that the songs that they sing, the Psalms that they have selected are called the Halal Psalms. And uh, I want to read, they're, they're, actually, if you want to know what psalms they are, you can read this uh, afterwards today, but Psalm 113 through 118, Psalm 113 through 118, but I want to read from the close, the close of the songs that they sing, Psalm 118. And as I read, I, I just want you to think, who is this talking about? Psalm 118, I want to begin reading with verse 21. I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me and art become my salvation. The stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. The stone which the builders removed. Who do you think that's talking about? We know from the New Testament that's talking about who? It's talking about Jesus. This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. You know, we quote that verse all the time, but we don't know the context. This is the day. You know what day I was talking about? It's talking about Good Friday. This is the day. The day that Jesus died. This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Who's that talking about? That's about Palm Sunday. Remember what Jesus said? You'll not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord which has showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even unto the horns of the altar. The sacrifice. It's talking about Jesus. Thou art my God, and I will praise thee. Thou art my God, I will exalt thee. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. And that brings us to the fourth cup. And this, will, this closes the traditional Passover Seder. And it's called the cup of praise. Now follow me. First cup, cup of holiness. Because God is holy. By the way, we, we don't read in the Bible that God is love, love, love. We read that God is holy, holy, holy. Because he is holy, he must judge sin. Second cup, the cup of judgment. If you are a sinner under the judgment of God, the only way to avoid that is to experience personal redemption. To have the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, applied to your own heart and life. That brings us to the third cup, which is the cup of redemption. And if you have been redeemed from that judgment, the only thing left to do is to praise him, the fourth cup, the cup of praise. Now, there's one more thing in Exodus 12 I need to share with you. And we're just going to call this making it personal. This is what so many people fail to do. They know the story, but they never make it personal. Exodus 12, verses 22 and 23. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house till the morning, for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer or permit the destroyer to come into uh, onto your homes to smite you personal making it personal let's suppose let's suppose you are an Israelite and you are living in Goshen at the time of the Passover judgment and let's suppose that you've heard the warning 
that the death angel is going to come through and that in every home the firstborn is going to be slain in all the land unless, unless what? Unless the blood is on that doorpost. You're an Israelite and you've had a busy day and you don't have very many lambs and you just kind of ignore it. You just kind of don't get around to it. What do you think is going to happen that night in your home? It's going to be judgment. Why? Because you never applied the blood. When Ruth and I first moved to Phoenix, a man in the church we were attending said to me, he said, I want to invite you to speak at our chapel services. If you don't know this, you probably do, but that Phoenix is the grass, fastest growing city in America right now, and it's a mecca for retirees. All the retirees, the secret's out. And uh, they have huge high-rise senior citizens places for seniors, and some of them actually have chapel services for the residents. And so I was invited to speak at the chapels and was told that sometimes Jewish people actually will come and attend the chapel services. So the very first one I was invited to speak at, there was a, a wonderful lady there who came and we became so close with her. And when she walked in, the man in charge of the chapel service said to me, he said, do you see the woman who just came in? She's Jewish and her name is Claire. So Ruth and I immediately went to her and welcomed her and greeted her and uh, she was very nice and providentially that day I was speaking on the 23rd Psalm and I uh, really gave it a strong Jewish flair as I spoke on the 23rd Psalm and I noticed I was, I was speaking that she was shaking her head uh, agreeing with a lot of what I was saying and after the service I said you know if there's anyone here who would like to talk with Ruth or I uh, Ruth or I were going to stay and, and uh, you know what happened? All the Gentiles got up and left. Claire stayed in her seat. And so we went to her and we talked for 20 minutes. And during that talk, I said, Claire, could I have your permission to, to come and visit you at your apartment sometime in the future? She said, I would like that. I think I've made two new friends today. But we are the friends of Israel. And we love the Jewish people. And so a couple weeks later, I called Claire and I said, Claire, Ruth and I would like to stop by today and we'd like to take you to lunch somewhere. Oh, she says, I would like that. And so we picked her up on a very uh, busy street called Bell Road in Phoenix. It's the main street in Phoenix. You're t we're, we were told we moved in. If it's not on Bell Road, you, they don't make it or you don't need it. I mean, it's there. Restaurant after restaurant after restaurant. And I said, Claire, where do you want to have lunch? And Claire was... Uh, partially blind and so she couldn't see real well and she said well uh, what is there and so I started naming off the restaurants and when I said Red Lobster she said that's where I want to go I want to go to Red Lobster so we're in Red Lobster and you know um, we began to talk with Claire and let me tell you we just bonded I mean we just became friends and so we would visit her from time to time and we invited her to go to church with us and one of the problems was that I'm out speaking most, week, both, uh, most weekends and Ruth is usually with me and so it was a few weeks before we had a Sunday and actually I just had a Sunday night open and so we took her to church with a Sunday night and they're having a fellowship afterwards and what are they serving? Ham, salad, sandwiches and we brought a Jewish guest. Well, Claire was a secular Jew, so she didn't follow dietary law anyway. Incidentally, about 80% of your Jewish neighbors and friends are secular. They don't follow dietary law. And so anyway, she, uh, she said, bring me a ham salad sandwich. I'm hungry. Well, the friendship grew, and after about six months into our friendship, I felt the friendship was strong enough that I could begin talking to my friend Claire about the Messiah. And because we were friends she would listen very politely. But when I would finish my little talk with her, she'd always end the discussion the same way. Our Messiah hasn't come yet. That's how she'd end it. This went on for nearly two years. 
talk to her, she'd listen. Our Messiah hasn't come yet. Then Claire was going through some difficult times physically. She had to have a hip replacement and so forth, and uh, she was in a, a rehab facility, and Ruth and I went to see her one night, and I was very discouraged. I said, in fact, I, I, I was so discouraged, I called my Jewish boss, Steve Herzig. I said, Steve, I have, I have used every approach I can think of with Claire, and all I get is, our Messiah hasn't come yet. Steve, what do I do now? Steve said, look, you've established such a friendship with Claire. Don't hold back. Be bold. So, I go to visit this Jewish woman. Ruth is with me. Before we left that night, I said, Claire, I want to read to you a bedtime story. Is that okay? She said, yes. So, you know what I did? I opened my Bible to the New Testament. And I started reading from the Gospel of John, first chapter, first verse, all the way down through the first 18 verses. You know what that's about? Jesus Christ, his deity, how all things have been made by him, and without him nothing has been made. And, and I read that to Claire. When I finished, you know what she said? She said, I just want you to know, I'm coming closer and closer to believing what you believe about Jesus. We left ecstatic, rejoicing. Go back to meet her uh, two weeks later. We go back to see her again. I said, Claire, how about another bedtime story? Oh, she said, I'd like that. I opened my Bible to the Gospel of John, first chapter, next verse. John the Baptist. Behold the Lamb of God. It was perfect. I read it to her. I explained it to her. I talked about the Passover lamb, the Passover Seder. I talked about the Levitical sacrificial lambs, how all of this pictured Jesus. Do you know what she said? Well, why would I need that? I haven't done anything wrong. Now I got a whole new problem. She's starting to understand who Jesus is. She doesn't see that she is sinful, that she needs a Savior. Well, it just so happened that my dear friend Claire, yeah, she had kind of a salty vocabulary, especially if she was upset or frustrated. And earlier in our conversation, she had taken the, the Lord's name in vain. So, I don't usually do this with people, but I did with her. I said, Claire, for a person who doesn't need a Savior, seems to me I just heard you break one of the Ten Commandments God gave to the Jewish people. And she went, oh, which one? I said, you took the name of the Lord your God in vain. She said, oh, that, like it was no big deal. I left so discouraged. I mean, I was, I'd made so much progress, I thought, and here we hit a blank wall again. Two weeks later, I go to see her. Ruth and I are going to see her again and this time I leave the Gospel of John I go to I go to Luke man I am this is warfare I go to Luke and I, I read to her the story about the proud Pharisee and the the tax collector you remember that proud Pharisee he he was so proud of how good he was of how righteous he was that he looked up to God and he said God I'm gonna paraphrase can I paraphrase aren't you impressed with me well, I've done all these things, and I haven't done all the, the bad things this guy's done. And, and God, I am so good, I even tithe. And not just on the regular stuff, I tithe on mint and cumin and dill. I mean, even on the little, God, I am great. Over here is a tax collector. He was, he was scum. He really was. And he knew it. In fact, he was so overcome by his own unworthiness, he wouldn't even look up to heaven. That was the traditional way of Jewish praying, was like this. He wouldn't look upward. He was ashamed. And he cried out to God and simply said, Lord, be merciful. He'd heard this guy's prayer, his prayer, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Which one 
receive salvation? This guy. I said, Claire, which one are you? She said, neither one. I said, no, 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 no. Those two represent everybody. Either you are a proud, self-righteous person who does not see their need for the grace of God, they do not see their need for a Savior, or you're like this man, and Claire began to cry. I said, Claire, what's wrong? She said, since you were here two weeks ago, God has shown me my sinfulness. She said, I want to know, do you think he'll still forgive me? I said, I know he will. Well, how do you know? I took out my Bible. And I began reading verses about God's forgiveness. And Claire said, I said to Claire, I said, Claire, do you, do you want that today? She said, I need that today. I said, Claire, you're Jewish. I want to ask you some questions. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the promised Messiah? She said, I do. I said, do you believe that he died on that tree, that he shed his blood to pay for your sin as well as mine? She said, I believe that. I said, are you ready to ask him to come into your life and be your Savior and your Lord? And she said, yes. How do I do it? I led her in prayer. And she prayed the sinner's prayer. Pastor Andy, you know what she said when she got done? She said, now you have no Claire. She's always got something to say. She said, I just, have, I just have one thing to say. I want you two to know I meant that with all of my heart. And that day, that Jewish woman took the blood of the lamb and she applied it personally. And she became a child of God. You may be a Gentile. You may be a professing Christian. My pastor recently told his story. He was going to a Baptist church in Texas. He got baptized. Three weeks later, he got saved. He'd gone through the tub. He'd never applied the blood. Then he had to get... He said, actually, what happened to me first time, I didn't get baptized, I just got wet. Then he had to get baptized. But point is, you can be in church, you can be a baptized member, but if you've never applied the blood, if you've never invited Jesus personally to be your own Savior, you see, each home had to appropriate a lamb. They had to make it their own. They had to eat from it. They had to apply the blood. And it's when we do that personally that he becomes our savior. And we, like Claire, become a child of God. You see, as I tell my Jewish friends, Gentiles and Jews today, we all have the same problem. We've all sinned. We're all under, we're all under the wrath of God because of it. And the only way out is to have a savior. And God has provided a lamb, a savior, his name is Jesus. And it's been portrayed for century after century after century through the Passover Seder. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this picture of the promised Messiah. A picture of a Messiah who would come and he would be selected because of his perfections. Indeed, he was the sinless one. And he was sacrificed. He was slain. And his blood was applied. He suffered greatly for us because of his love. And we're thankful that not only is the Messiah clearly seen, but his message is boldly proclaimed throughout the Seder. We thank you for that message of grace and forgiveness that is found in him. In Jesus' name, amen.